Hi, my name is Arno, and I'm gonna talk today about mental models for the win. Uh, also, why you should be more like a surgeon or than GP. And we'll see what I don't tell later. Let's start by talking about me. Uh, so, I'm a software engineer at Rapid7. Uh, I've been there for five years now. Uh, I'm working on Inside IDR product, which is um, an intrusion detection system. Uh, and specifically on the what we call the ABA feature, which is basically uh, we use information for from our team to tune rules and detect things that are not behavior related. Uh, well, they are behavior related, but not not classic behavior related. Uh, and as a lot of companies in Rapid uh, in Belfast, Rapid7 is hiring, and I'm hiring. I've got two uh, rack open, so if you're interested, just get in contact. Uh, I started as a software developer in 1999. Uh, that makes me quite uh, an old developer. Um, and I remember still the, the internet bubble crash and the 2008 financial crash. Uh, beautiful time, I suppose. Uh, and I've got three children, two boys and one girl, and we'll talk about the boys next. Uh, I got Freddy, who's a nine-year-old boy. He's got dyspraxia, probably he hasn't been diagnosed, but uh, he's basically a bit clumsy. Uh, he can't catch a ball really well, and let's say he's got coordination issues. And we've got Dexter, a seven-year-old, uh, and he doesn't have issues that way. He's got other problems, but uh, that's not relevant here. Um... And so they kind of both learn cycling at the same age, about five. And as you would expect, it was a lot easier for Dexter to to learn how to cycle. Uh, Freddy was frustrated a lot, and it took slightly longer time for him to get the basics. So like, get your balance right, the cold start is always quite hard, uh, turning, and all that kind of stuff. But the amazing thing is that once a skill is acquired, cycling, then they're at the same level and dyspraxia is uh, not in the picture anymore. So by learning a skill, you kind of overcome, you know, differences in 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 uh, capabilities, initial differences in capabilities. And, and we'll talk about that a bit later, but that's something to keep in mind. And when I talk about cycling skills, um, it's, it's important to remember or to, to know that basically cycling scale use a mental model. So when you learn how to cycle, your brain is building a mental model. And mental model are, are used not just for cognitive functions, like thinking math or uh, your SQL or your Java skills or all those kind of stuff, but also for physical skills. So uh, when you learn to play basketball and to shoot stuff or golf or whatever, I don't play golf, but uh, you're basically using mental model to support your interaction with the physical world. Uh, and another thing to note that you probably know is that you cannot learn to cycle by reading a book. You need to physically do it. You need to do it. So skills only develop if you practice them, if you do them. Uh, and that's the difference between knowledge and skill. You, you can be very knowledgeable, but that doesn't mean that you know how to do things. Uh, unless you live, you know, in the movie Matrix, where you can learn Kung Fu just by being plugged in, which would be very cool, but uh, that's not the way it is right now. Now we're going to talk about the brain, not that uh, evil mouse, one that wants to take over the world, but uh, more specifically about the cognitive process. So when you're thinking about something, that's called the cognitive process, and you're, you're making use of like the conscious, and it requires full focus, um, uh, and it's pretty slow and costly uh, and it's error prone to and you need to use your working memory and the working memory is limited so you can only keep in the working memory between three to seven memory chunks um, and so so if you take the example of like when you start to cycle you you're gonna use the, the slow way of of you know of thinking about cycling and that takes some time and that's why you're not very good but once you acquire the skill you don't need to use a cognitive process to deal with that. It goes into the background uh, noise. Um, and uh, if you look at the working memory, you know, you got, let's say you got four slots, you can put like 
you know, words or numbers in there. But the amazing thing is that you can also put a Montal model. A Montal model only use one slot. And that means you can have, you can integrate with uh, the cognitive system, you can actually have a lot more data. And that's how people would do um, um, memorization competition uh, can memorize a lot more because they have the, that limitation of the working memory. The working memory is fixed. Uh, you, if you got five slots, you you have you forever have five slots. So you can only remember five, uh, keep five things in the working memory. But people can remember a lot more than that. And the way they do that is they develop mental models that allow them to store more information in there that can be stored in one slot or multiple slots. So more and more, there are a lot of background processing. So when you drive your car, you don't think about it and you can talk or, uh, you know, you don't go on your phone, but uh, you still need to focus, but it's a lot easier than when you start. Uh, and it will expand what you can retain working memory. So it's, it's a big win. They're very useful. Now we're going to talk a bit about intelligence. And intelligence is basically what uh, we consider to be like the performance of the cognitive system. And there's difference in performance. And, and, and so generally, we also talk about G or general intelligence. And we measure it via IQ test. Now, there's a lot of controversy about that. But IQ uh, and general intelligence are the most re replicated result in all psychology. So there's plenty of study. Stuart Ritchie wrote a book about that. Uh, there's a lot of interesting results in there. I strongly advise you to read it. I haven't yet, but I should. And um, IQ, which is a proxy for general intelligence, is a good predictor of income education level, which might not be that surprising, but also health and longevity. And IQ is also useful. For example, my uh, Freddie uh, has got dyslexia. And one of the first things they do is they do an IQ test to see if there's some other fundamental disability. Uh, but uh, he was very bad at reading, so at dog, for example. Uh, um, but because they did an IQ test and it was normal on there, they can be sure that, you know, it's dyslexia and, you know, he'll have a hard time reading and writing all his life. But, you know, he's making progress. Uh, but, yeah, health and longevity. Uh, we don't really know why that's the case, but uh, there's, there's some strong correlation there. So... Um, that's the way it is. Uh, another thing to know about intelligence or IQ is that it's mostly fixed and it's highly inheritable. So the last, their last studies show that it might be 80% uh, um, based on genetics and, and the genes you inherit from your parents. And so you can't change that. So there's there's some work to try and figure out how we can improve intelligence on people. And they have some modest results that can work on some targeted people. Uh, still like a work in progress. We also know that there are obviously like some environmental like lead as a big impact. So it's not like just genetic, but when I say it's 80% genetics, it's like in our current environment, we will not have those environmental factor. Uh, so, you, once you're there and you got your genital intelligence, you have it. That's basically what you're you're born with. Uh, some people, like Nassim Taleb, uh, are very skeptical of IQ, uh, but um, well, Nassim Taleb's skills is uh, in statistics. Uh, apparently, not so much in hedge fund management, uh, but yeah, his ego is definitely big. Um, so I would not listen to Taleb on those things. There's some people who study that as they're living, and they all would say that all the cognitive psychology will say that IQ is it's standing up very well. So how does intelligent impact your skills? Well, the the only thing that it really does is that it makes the acquisition of skills easier. It's the same way that the dyspraxia uh, make Freddy be slower at acquiring the skill of cycling. Uh, intelligence make overall the acquisition of skill easier. But it doesn't impact to what level you can become an expert or to what level you can develop those skills. What that means is that if you got somebody that is very high on the IQ, somebody that is normal on the IQ, the guy who's normal on the IQ can become better than the person who's uh, very high on the IQ. 
And we know that because when they study chess master, chess grandmaster, or other people that are experts on some skill, they find that there's no correlation between the IQ and the level that they acquired that skill. So that's pretty good. We can overcome the uh, IQ difference on the skill level. So um, Anders Eriksson wrote a book called Peak, uh, which talks a lot about all the subject, and I would highly recommend to read it too. Uh, and so the only way to develop a skill is to practice. Uh, there's no other way. You, you can't read about a skill and learn about it. You need to do it and do it and do it again. And that's why if you go to a training and you just listen, well, you probably won't get better at it. But if you have some exercise and you practice, and the best training have exercise where you can get feedbacks and practice your techniques. But out of all the practice, the best way is deliberate practice. And deliberate practice, it's, it's very involved, and that's what all the, ground, uh, the big experts uh, have to do. So you need to break down the process into parts. You need to work on each part of the process and target. You need to test and get feedback every time. And it's a very lengthy process and it's very costly and it's a lot of work on. You need a lot of motivation. Now I'm gonna digress and talk a bit about the, the physicians or the GP uh, and the surgeon. Uh, and and we'll see at the end what that's about. In uh, there was a research done and they were studying doctors and, uh, and physicians, and they show that. Basically, over the course of their career, their performance was becoming worse. So they were better two or three years out of school than they were 20 or 30 years after. And that's quite surprising because we expect people to gain skill with experience. But that's not always the, always the case. You can actually, even if you gain experience, you can actually lose your skill. You need the right kind of experience. That's the skilling. And I'm sure you know some people who sitting somewhere and or getting worse by the day. And but if you look at surgeons, there was a study from Andrew Vickers study the removal of prostate cancer. And basically they need to remove the prostate and make sure, make sure they remove all the cancerous tissue so it doesn't uh, reappear. And they find that the more surgery they did, the better the outcome was. So um, basically it's the opposite by the surgeon with their experience, we're getting better at it. Upscaling. So we have their experience that doesn't, uh, that descales you and experience that is good. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that on the surgeon side, each surgery is a challenge in itself. It's gonna test their skills, it's gonna push their mental model. There's something that's gonna go wrong or not be right or be slightly different. And also they get more feedbacks. Uh, they get feedbacks immediately when, while they're doing the surgery, uh, you know, the vital of the, their client, customer, um, patient. Uh, but they also keep the feedback of uh, the long-term uh, outcomes because generally they do like big things, so they need to keep track of those. As uh, when you're a GP, you don't you don't get the same challenges. Most of the things you're gonna see are modern uh, ailments that uh, you're gonna tell the person to get uh, paracetamol or ibuprofen, or you're gonna tell the parents that it's just a, a virus rash, um, a viral rash, which uh, when you're your first viral rash, you're probably gonna go to the doctor or for it help. It's just a viral rash. Uh, and so they don't get the same challenges and they don't get the same feedbacks because uh, how many times you go back to the doctor and say, oh, that paracetamol worked very well with me. That stuff, the stuff you go to the, mostly to use the GP for or things that are gonna just cure themselves eventually. And when they're not, where you go is you're gonna see a specialist. So the big challenging case, they, they get offloaded to somebody else. And they probably don't get feedbacks on what happened anyway there. So, so uh, and also I think one thing to get from that is that you want a young GP, but you, if you're gonna get surgery, you want an old surgeon. So what does that mean for your career? Because 
practice and even more developed practice is not always practical. Like you can't just spend time rehearsing or working on something. And I know some people are doing kata, but um, we don't even know what are the right practice in our in our stuff. A lot of people have big opinions about what we should do and what we should not do. Uh, and I think we should drive more uh, by the outcome of what we're doing, which was like pollution stability or customer satisfaction. And and you know, it's how we code. Like, how do we know that's the right choice or not? People have a lot of opinions, but the, the people who have a lot of opinions, most of the time, they're the people who do talks and then other people who have to deliver products. So, and, and, and to do that in the real world, it's even more uh, sad. It's just there was a study to uh, measure the impact of deliberate practice on performance in different uh, occupations. And as you can see there, in professions, so professional, Deliberate practice made just 1% difference in performance outcomes. In games and music, it made 21, 26% difference. Now I imagine that also depending on where you are in games and things, like the higher rank you are, it makes, it makes a bigger difference or not. So it's not just not practical to just do deliberate practice all the time, it's probably not worth it. And that might be because not all work requires skills. A lot of things is communication, understanding requirements, and all those things are going to require, you know, using your cognitive skills, uh, your cognitive process. Although if you understand the business and you have a business model, a uh, mental model for the business, that probably help too. Um, but those, those mental, business, mental models business are, are not going to be uh, transferable to other business, but they're still useful. Uh, but also not all work is repeated enough to acquire skills. So you, there's a lot of things that we do that change all the time. And so it, it, you can't acquire a skill there. What's also likely is that skill is value, um, is drive by specialization. So the more specialized you are at one thing, the more skills are going to be important because if you specialize, you're basically narrowing your scope of focus and it's then worse focusing on something and improving on the skill. And I think that's also what it tells us in the numbers previously. It's like games and music are, are very specialized. You know, you play one instrument, you play one sort of game. So specialization in where skill shines and where you need to invest in, 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 in that. But not everybody can be a specialist. Uh, and also if you want to be a specialist, you need the skills because otherwise nobody's going to hire you as a specialist. Um, are we as software developer specialists? I believe in some way we are, uh, but not everybody is having you know the same kind of specialization needs. So um, to summarize, I think you know you don't want to de-skill and and you want to improve your skill even if you don't have to practice on them. And if we look at the surgeon, you need to be challenged. If you're not challenged in your job, you're gonna de-skill. So, and that's, that's something you would see when you interview, you got people, they, they've been, they've been a uh, software engineer for like 10 years and you got somebody else, some uh, software engineer for two years and the two year person is a lot more uh, skilled than the 10 year person. And that's because they were more challenged at their work. They took more on and they, they learned a lot more. So if you are bored at your work and you don't get challenged, you get a paycheck, but you're you're losing opportunity to improve yourself. And you're losing opportunity to improve yourself, but also to get a job where you can get more challenge. So try to push yourself. And if your work is not challenging, try to make it challenging. You know, go beyond the requirements. Ask, you know, make your stuff performant even if it doesn't need to. Uh, try to implement clean code techniques, uh, test coverage if it's appropriate, might not always be. Just try to do those things. Uh, automation is a great way to make something that is repetitive and boring interesting. So uh, you can do that. If, if there's something you need to do every so often that is you know, not challenging, well, try to automate it. That probably is challenging. Uh, you can have also side projects. The answer of side projects is you can do whatever you want. You can experiment uh, the side project and I wanted to do the fastest CSV parser in Java. And 
I couldn't have done that at work because nobody wants me to do the fastest CSV parser in Java. There's no interest in that. Uh, and that allowed me to investigate things and discover things and go into uh, all the VM, JIT stuff and, and look at ASM and learn to read what uh, the assembly generated is and notify pattern where we can um, improve things. Uh, and if, you know, the last thing is probably get a new job. There's plenty of company hiring, wink, wink. We also need feedback. Um, but I think we, by feedback, I don't mean feedback just from people, also they can be important. I mean, feedback from production uh, metrics to see how our code behave, uh, what's happening with it. Does it stand the test of time? They did the thing I wrote, uh, is it behaving while in production? There's a thing I wrote, is it easy to change? And you can only get that if you keep working on the same code base. If you write something, ship it, forget about it. You'll never learn from it. Uh, and I put a question mark in code review because I tend to think that sometimes it's a bit of a bowel and nitpicking on styling. And I do rather have feedback from production and customer as to how it works. Um, those are the most important thing that we're trying to carry out. And especially there's sometimes solution that are, you know, they're not gonna please any, everybody. I'll not show you some code, but. Uh, dig in, dig in is very important. So your mental model is working in the background and sometimes something just doesn't feel right and you don't know, you, you don't know why, but it's your mental f uh, f um, model feedbacking to your, your conscious. And that can mean two things. Either your mental model is wrong or there's something really wrong. And it's worth investigating because if there's something wrong, well, that might blow up soon. And if your mental model is wrong, it's worth investigating because you're going to learn something. You're going to expand it. And uh, but why we, we tend to give bugs to, um, to new starter, and, and it's not a punishment, it's because bugs is a great way to learn how the system works because you have to dig everywhere and you have to build a mental model. So for example, if you got somebody, if you want to learn about a system, take the bug. If somebody else take the bugs too, that's fine. Take it too, try to fix it. If you don't fix it before it does, you'll still have, uh, you'll, you'll have some learning about that. The la last thing I believe, uh, is that failure is the only way to expand your mental model. So when you fail at something, there's a mismatch between reality and your mental model. And that means it's a, an opportunity to learn. No, it might be also because, you know, some other stuff, but uh, all, most failure on an opportunity to learn, to expand, to, to, to fix some gap in your knowledge and in your mental model. So we need the ability to fail and identify failure. So like if you got a system that doesn't feed back to you when something doesn't go as expected, then you'll never know that it's failing. So um, we, we, in my team, every exception that we don't expect to happen, will send an email. And so we have to then make a decision because that can be very noisy as to, well, is it something we expect to happen? Then we need to handle it, you know, keeping in the metrics to see if feed stays under a certain ratio, or we need to fix a problem because there's something wrong. Uh, another way to deal with that is to have a nice staging environment that is the exact reproduction of production, uh, but that can be very costly and it's not always doable, uh, but it's still good for testing. You need a staging or you need like a, a pipeline. Uh, you, need, you need a copy of that you can experiment and play with. You can also have code and uh, your application and dependent process can make it so that it's easy to roll back and you can fail in production and it doesn't really matter. So, um, and, and those are good to have. Uh, we, we do that. So like if something failed, we just roll it back and then it continue processing. That's obviously more for like pipeline processing and background process than live stuff because you, that would impact the customer. But there's a way to do that too on the on the customer facing side with uh, um, degradation, uh, failover, and stuff like that. And it's always good to think about that beforehand. 
Uh, and that's about it for the presentation. So I imagine that I'll be listening to that in R and that maybe right now you'll have some question for me. And that's it. Thank you.